Uh, my name is uh, Theodore H. Friedgut. I'm a retired professor of Russian and Slavic studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, the book that interests us today is one called Yusufka and Lucian, which came out some time ago but has had a new edition recently. And that's what provoked the interest in it. The book itself tells the stories of the origin and development of the first uh, you know, 50 years of the city of Donetsk, which started as a you know, mine and metallurgy settlement built on the barren steppes of the southern Ukraine and developed into the city of over a million that it is now without changing much of its nature. It's still a coal and steel city in many ways. Well, I was interested in Nikita Khrushchev, as a matter of fact, whom, as most of us know, uh, he spent some years there in, in Yusufka, as was then known, in uh, the years uh, uh, of his youth. His father came uh, as many almost all the all the uh, staff of, of the city came as you know, wandering peasants looking for work in the winter, in the off-season of the winter. And his family came there and eventually settled there as more and more of these you know, Russian minor, Russian peasants did. And uh, so he grew into it and he worked uh, in metal work and in mining and became really a maintenance man for one of the mines there. And uh, I thought I'd write about him, but as I investigated the early period of the city, the city appeared to me to be more interesting. And it's, uh, it's truly a, a, an amazing story of how, why, why would a cessful British or Welsh uh, mining uh, and metallurgy engineer you know, accept an invitation from the Russian government and agree to settle in a, a godforsaken place. His first, his first housing was a shepherd's hut out on the steps where there was nothing and they found that was the place that had coal and that had uh, good coking coal and they found iron ore not not too far away, and it had enough water to to develop it. And he said, "Here, this this is the place to build a, a, a metallurgy complex." The Russian government had invited him and offered him to develop in Saint Petersburg to develop the industry. But he took one look at what was there and asked, where's your raw materials? And the raw materials were all imported for a great distance. So he said no. And he had learned of earlier prospecting that had been done you know, by Russian uh, prospectors or uh, servant surveyors who had found that there are considerable uh, raw material in the southern Ukraine. And he went down there to take a look, and he said, yes, that's it. And he sat there, he and three of his sons, his wife and four other children remained in Wales, and they went to work, and he really did go to work. The Russians were interested in developing a factory that would produce rail railways. This was the beginning of the spread of the railways in Russia and they needed to have their own rail source and so he did that and uh, starting making iron rails and then moving up to steel rails and one of the most exciting moments in my research there was when I found the series of telegrams that he was sending to St. Petersburg from his, his little office what began as they, they called it Yuzovsky Zavod, and of course then, then it uh, turned into Yuzovka. That's the source. It's the Hughes factory. This was John Hughes of uh, 
Martha Tidfield in Wales, who well, was building this. So it was the Hughes factory and became Yusufka until in 1924, after about a week in which it was called Trotsk, it turned into Stalino. There, there, were, there, there was a strong group of Trotskyites there, and that, of course, had played a, a great political role in the political struggles of, for the nature of the city. But the Stalinists won out, as they did throughout the Soviet Union. Anyway, uh, one of the exciting moments was I found all the telegrams when he was carrying on the first experiments to, to create steel from, from the iron ore and, and coal that he had. And the satisfaction and triumph where they, they worked, there was a whole week where they were working nonstop to to try and make the blast furnaces produce this material, and they finally succeeded. And there's one telegram informing St. Petersburg that it's a success, and that from now on they will produce steel rails, which of course were much stronger, needed less, less maintenance than the iron rails. There was nothing. It was like the uh, Saskatchewan prairies in the 30s, I suppose you would uh, compare it with. It was barren land used mainly for grazing of, of sheep and a few cattle. And there was uh, not, not very much uh, agriculture there. What was happening was that the, uh, the Ukraine, not far from there, was developing after the, the abolition of British restrictions on importing grain, Russia began to be a grain supplier for Great Britain. That was in the 1840s. And people found, since the, the grain was going from the Black Sea coast, and the, from the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea, it was through the Mediterranean to Great Britain, it began to develop that there was... Uh, a great advantage in grain growing in the Ukraine. But you had to transport it, and to transport it by, by river or by ox cart or by mule cart was very slow and, and uh, expensive because you couldn't make huge carts. And that, that gave the impetus to building building the railways, and to build the railways there, near where the grain growing was was developing, made it all the more attractive. And this this was the impetus for changing, changing Russia from uh, being a peasant country to beginning industry. Before, before Hughes, there wasn't any real industry in the southern Ukraine. His, was, his showed that it could be done, and then French and German and Belgian investments came in uh, following his pattern and finding places where there was coal and where there was iron ore and beginning a development of uh, heavy industry. This is when Yekaterinoslav grew up in, into being uh, Dnepropetrovsk as it was after after 1917, Yekaterinoslav turned into a large city and a heavy indi industrial city. Oh, that's where that's where Ukrainian peasants, that's where the Ukrainians lived. The Ukrainians were a rural people at this time, and until the middle, well, not the middle, but until the 1920s, when they were mobilized into the factories. Now. Uh, for the first five-year plan, the Ukrainians were a peasant people. The, the cities in Ukraine were Russian and Jewish, uh, or Russian and Jewish and some Polish. And even Yuzovka, when it was founded, they didn't attract peasants from the Ukraine. The peasants in the Ukraine wanted to remain on the land. The land was theirs. There was there was very little serfdom in uh, 
in Ukraine, and the land was theirs, and they liked having their own land, and they, even though the peasant life was very hard and very poor, they preferred that to the city. The workers of the Ukraine, the labor force, were peasants from, particularly from more northern regions in Russia, who in the winter came down to find work. Some of them worked on the on the uh, grain growing that was beginning after the 1840s, but many of them were recruited into the mines and the factories, and eventually, instead of going back to to their village for the uh, sowing and for the harvest, they remained as workers in the industrial development of the Ukraine. So what you had was a Ukrainian nation that was rural on the land and Russian immigrants in the cities. This is, this is the root of the conflict that you have today. The cities and industrial developments were not Ukrainian in nature, they were Russian. Even though they were in the Ukraine, part of the Ukraine, they were peopled by, by Russians or by Jews. In 1917, when uh, the, the city was uh, already well established, you find that the largest ethnic group are Russians, after them come the Jews, and then come the Ukrainians, and then Poles and Belarusians, and a whole mixture of everything, Greeks and Armenians and, and what have you. This is, this is the root of a conflict that is so painful to the Ukraine today. See, fortunately, because, because the uh, whole project of Yuzovka had started in 1869, you know, deposit libraries throughout the Russian Empire you know, received copies of all the, news, the current newspapers with the, the, the information of what was happening day by day. And one of these libraries is the Helsinki University Library, which is a wonderful library, and their Slavic collection is uh, just a, a wonderful place, a very friendly place, and you can read the, all the newspapers of, uh, the, of the South and see what was going on and get, get the reports. In addition to which... Uh, this is in the in the nineteen late nineteen seventies when there's a detente going, and uh, I was able to get into the historical archive in Petersburg in what was then Leningrad, and sit there and get documents, uh, which were invaluable for me. And uh, in addition, there's a great deal of material that was published by the Soviet Union, you know, records of uh, all kinds of things in the, the Civil War and the Revolution, the Revolution in the Ukraine, the Bolsheviks in the Revolution in the Ukraine. So this gave me a, an additional yeah, documentary source. So I, I had various sources and they, they came out uh, very well. And the the highlight of it was when in 1987, when I was just finishing the first volume, well, it started out to be one book, but it got so big that it, nobody would publish a book that size, so I split it into two. The first volume has the work, the sociological aspects of, and sociological and economic aspects of the formation of Yuzovka, and it's development through the revolution and, and the civil war and the the second volume is politics and revolution all well, the the growth of of the revolutionary parties and the nature of the of the czarist regime and the post-revolutionary struggles to what which way were would the bolsheviks go and uh, so it turned out to be two two different volumes. And the first one is uh, 
that's my, my favorite, really, because it gives you the nitty-gritty of life there, of how, how people actually lived and worked. That I found more interesting than, than the, the, this, the fighting and fighting and wars and, and revolution that was later the, the theme. Hughes was, he, he started life as the, the son of a steel worker in, in uh, Wales and uh, did an apprenticeship with his father and learned, learned steel making from the ground up, uh, then became an engineer and he, he made his fame when he opened his own, his own steel making firm and he got the contract to do armor plating for the whole British Navy. And that's, that's what brought him to the attention of the Russian government, that his armor plating was better than anyone else's. And uh, he soon had a large order for the armor plating of uh, the, the forts at the entrance to the St. Petersburg Harbor. And uh, then came the uh, invitation to go over and to see what could be done in Russia in producing steel, particularly steel rails. And uh, he liked challenges and he liked, he liked uh, new things. And so he picked up this challenge and uh, went, went into it his whole heart. He, he lived the rest of his life in Russia. In, in fact, he, he died in Russia you know, of a heart attack uh, when it was in St. Petersburg uh, on business. Uh, and his sons maintained the family, the family interest in it and maintained the factory afterwards. They only sold out in the middle of World War I and uh, received the, the very last payment. They insisted that after they sold it to a French firm, they insisted that the money be paid in pounds sterling in London. And this was very hard to uh, arrange during World War I. And the, the business went back and forth and around and through America to get the money and, and send it to, to London. And uh, they got their last payment in September of 1917, <laughs> a month before the Bolsheviks took over. They got out. And only, well, there was one daughter had married into a Russian family, and she maintained, she, she held on to some of her shares of, of the new Russia iron and steel rail producing company. And of course, they were worth nothing after the revolution. They never, they never got compensation for them. But all the rest of the family had sold out except one one son also maintained a package of shares, but they they put their lives into making that into a, a real flagship of uh, modernity, socially as well as industrially. They had a model farm that served to provide a good uh, food food supply for the for the settlement. Uh, they had uh, schools that were uh, far, far more advanced than the church schools, which were the only ones in the early days. Uh, they, uh, they had clinics and a hospital, although uh, one, of the, one of the books I read mentioned that it was uh, unfortunate that the hospital windows overlooked the cemetery. <laughs> and that was not good for the patient's morale. But they did have... Uh, clinics and hospitals and uh, tried to provide tried to provide things for the workers well the daily sustenance was not too too good even though you know I, I suppose it was yeah, better than in most of the settlements and, and better than in the, most of the villages however uh, Hughes was very much you know set on his peasants turning into workers. So he would not let them keep animals 
or grow more than a small garden uh, around their around their home. They they had to put in their time and their energy had to go into the factory. And he said, Welsh Welsh work, work in their factories and mines. They do not, they're not peasants, and you will not be peasants. And it was uh, the same uh, with with the uh, social end of it. That uh, I don't know how well this was enforced, but you were not uh, you were not allowed to have guests who stayed over for any length of time. Because of course the, the the tendency would be to if you had a corner free in your little, little cabin if you had a little cabin then you you would rent it out to some peasant from the north who, who was working oh, through the winter and you could only have guests who stayed the length of a normal a normal social visit which would be three three hours or so and it, he tried to to impose the, these ways of life that were strange to the to the Russian peasants and which you know went against their interests actually because if you had a wife and, and a few children at home and you were working in the mine or in in the metal factory you know, what would the the woman and children do all day? Let them let them work. Let them cultivate the land and produce, you know, vegetables for the you know, potatoes and onions and cabbage for, for for the family. But uh, Hugh said no. The the kids go to school and the woman the woman keeps the house, and uh, you can only have a, a small small garden beside it. None none of this half peasant half worker stuff for me and so he, he got them to to live there and uh, imposed his regime on them and then uh, it was uh, not not an easy I mean they, the working conditions you can see by the by the cover of the book you see these workers the miners in the in the shaft working you know straight to the waist because these were deep mines and and the temperature was very high and you have you have workers who hauled the call of the coal to the elevators to, to get it taken out and they they were in place of mine ponies at the beginning because the shafts were too small for putting in animals and so they were on hands and knees. They would pull these sledges of, of coal to from the coal face to the elevator. They, their life was really like that of animals in many ways. As I said before, the the workers were mainly Russian peasants who were seeking off season work. And then when you know you couldn't you couldn't. Uh, the first few years the factory would close down in the summertime because there were no workers available the Ukrainians around them the peasants didn't want to go into the factory and the mines and they had their own farms and they would and their own flocks of sheep and goats and and uh, the Russian peasants would come down for the, for the year after the harvest but when it's time to to sow your fields in northern Russia in the end of April or start of May, they had to go home to 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 see that they their land was properly prepared and that they'd have something some eat over the winter in their family. So the Russians had to be tempted into into the mines. Well, in the mines and in the factory, you could make certainly much more money. And Hughes tried to provide housing. First, first miners they would live in dugouts into the in the ground, uh, but little by little he built housing that still stands today and is still under in use today. When I was in in now uh, in Donetsk in 1989, I got a good tour of what. Uh, what were called the four ruble houses because they were the latest the four ruble houses cost a miner four rubles a month to rent 
but they had running water in them and uh, eventually even electricity. And they're still being used and uh, still with only a little, a little flower garden and, and the few vegetables out in front. So the Russians gradually turned into horse. The Jews came as a you know, service. The, they were the, the service uh, class, groceries and, and tailors and shoemakers and uh, owners, owners of, the, of the pub, which was very, you know, very popular. And the, they would uh, they would provide all of these services. Also, the doctors uh, were Jewish, and eventually there were, as Yuzuka developed it, uh, the the, the singer sewing machine agent and and the few other agencies like that were in Jewish hands. And there was a Jewish school. But they were the, the second class. The first were, were the Russian workers. And only later did the Ukrainians come in. And the, the big influx of Ukrainians is in 1926-27, in preparation for the five-year plan, where you wanted, you wanted to get the, to expand the industry tremendously and this was done largely although that was not the what was supposed to be done. the first first five year plan was based on just pouring in manpower and it, it was uh, the the great you know construction of the Nepostroy the you know the great dam in Nepropetrovsk and uh, of the industries there was done by just pouring in manpower. That is, a, a lot of the work that was supposed to be done by mechanical excavators, which either didn't come or were or broke down very quickly, was done by people with buckets and carts and moving huge amounts of, of land. And uh, only then did the... The Ukrainian peasant was mobilized off the farm and into into industry. And then, after World War II, there was a, a great move into into the cities as well. Uh, so that the, the city grew up being the schools were mainly in Russian. After the Russian Revolution, Ukrainian language schools, you know. Under the under the Russian Empire, Ukrainian could not be used as a language. It was not recognized by the Tsar and, and his ministers. But after the revolution, there was some introduction of Ukrainian culture in, in school and and uh, theater and, and uh, you know, folklore, but uh, nothing compared to Russia. When, when I was there in the 80s, now the, the films were Russian films. The, the advertising was in Russian. The, uh, the menus in, in the uh, restaurant were in, in Russian. Now, everything was in Russian, uh, even though this was the Ukrainian Republic and supposedly an independent republic. So and when the... In 1989, miners' strike was on, and they wanted to negotiate with the authorities. They went to Moscow and not to Kiev. So it was it was a Russian Russian milieu, and not the Ukrainian one. Although the Ukrainian presence was growing all the time, the the one the one kind of offense for which you paid with your life or with your career was bourgeois nationalism under under the communist regime who were the heads of the uh, of the Ukrainian administration Nikita Khrushchev who was a 
a Russian from Korsk Oblast and who who was very sensitive to his being a Russian head of the Ukraine and, and Lazar Kaganovich who came from the Ukraine but was a Jew. Even the Ukrainians who got to be in, in the latter years got to be the head of the of the party organization or the government, they were they understood that they were at the pleasure of Moscow, and uh, there there yes yes there were feelings there, but they were suppressed and uh, you couldn't you couldn't do very much with them because Moscow had all the power, they they controlled the uh, the appointments of people and they controlled you know. What was done, how the development, etc. Once Hughes was, you know, brought in there and remained there, it was uh, it was pretty clear how it was going, and and his relations with the government were were always very good. Uh, he was working for them essentially, and uh, working to to make make his company succeed for the Russian Empire, not for the Ukraine, because there, there was no, no separate Ukrainian uh, republic at that time. He, was, he worked only, for, only for, for the Tsar in St. Petersburg. Mining was known in Russia, and uh, I suppose the, the machinery, is as, as much as there was machinery, because there was, there was no... You know, no real mechanical uh, steam except steam engines, which were common throughout Europe at that time. Uh, for the for the mining, it was all hand labor down under there, and and they didn't even have wheeled carts or or rails left in the early days. They had these wooden sledges that were pulled by people and. And it's pickaxe, pickaxe and shovel uh, on the coal face. And but building building a blast furnace was totally. He and his crew did that, and he did have uh, British uh, skilled workers and as foremen and the engineers working under him. And. But they built things there, and built their blast blast furnace and, and uh, all the all the machinery to to uh, roll the roll the uh, cast iron and, and convert it into steel. When he when he was having such success and making very good money out of it, then uh, the others came in from from all over Europe. And the Russian government was, of course, very interested in having foreigners come in and develop. They didn't have the the capital or the know-how, and they they were interested in getting. So they got in French companies, Belgian companies, and German companies, and you know, all all sorts you find there. Well, that was that was the the kickoff that 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 put it into motion and showed it could be done and done successfully that it was a good investment. I mean, Hughes was, was investing his, his own capital and uh, uh, developing it, but uh, immediately was, was making a profit on it. And uh, was, as soon as they, the others saw that there was profit to be made in Russia, they, they came despite the difficulties of doing business in Russia. And uh, this, this will be... My, my lecture for the coming uh, Congress of the, of the Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences, they're having in Regina, where I was born, so how could I not go to it? And I'm going to lecture on a memo that I found written by a, you know, a, an economist of the Lyonnais, which was very... Yeah, active in in the providing capital for development in Russia, on the the special costs of doing business in Russia, who you have to bribe and why you have to bribe them, the policeman and telegraph office, 
you know, operators and anyone you if you want things to get done there's one way to do it just grease it grease it with a little bit of rubles and he explains this very carefully to his employers in Paris and uh, I, I found this in, in the archive of the Credit Lyonnais a wonderful, wonderful you know, memorandum which and I had intended to publish it long ago but I never got around to it now maybe I will I did get into the historical archive where everything is available there I mean I was getting most that were sent to the czar and his with his notes in the, in the margin and what should be done about it uh, all the all the problems that they had there I did get into the Credit Lyonnais uh, archive to, to the New Russia Company archive, which is held with the business archive so in Great Britain. And so they, I, I think I got a, a fair complete and accurate picture. And it was, uh, that, that was, I, I think, the, the most fun I've ever had on doing research was all the things I was able to dig up there. In 1917, uh, Yusufka had about 70,000 people. When I was born in Regina in 1931, there were only 60,000 in Regina, but it wasn't an industrial town at all. But uh, 70,000 was uh, was pretty good. There were, there were, even in the 1980s, there were 20 active coal mines under the city. You know, the, the city is built above the coal mines. And the original steel works still works and still sells, sells steel internationally. And uh, goes, it's, uh, it's not the largest. The city grew to over a million people and uh, struggled, struggled to be a good place to live. You know, for every child born in the city, they planted a rose bush. So you have two parks of, of flowers there. And they planted double rows of trees to catch the, the, all the soot and, and the smoke from the air, which, which was very prevalent. It, it was a, a vibrant and growing, growing concern all, all through from... From its beginning and even through the Soviet period, it uh, grew and grew and grew to what is uh, now. Now it's being destroyed. I'm afraid. One of one of the things that uh, you'll find here is uh, more than another is the the uh, violence of the city. Although you can find that in in some. Uh, uh, literary treatments of of Yusufka, the uh, the violence of of the uh, government, the, um, the the Cossack rule of of the place, and the police rule, is keeping people keeping people in line, and uh, uh, the the. Uh, Inter-ethnic tensions. There are any number of pogroms against the Jews of Yusufka uh, from from a, almost its beginnings, uh, including the, during a cholera a cholera plague, cholera epidemic that broke out. The uh, the usual accusation it's that are poisoning the wells. And uh, it uh, caused a, a tremendous uh, pogrom in which half the Jewish quarter of the, the city was burned down. And uh, things, that was 1892. That was the great, the great cholera epi epidemic of 1892. Now, there's an article in Slavic Review that I wrote about the cholera riots in as a separate uh, subject there, but uh, in in many many cases, uh, 
there were there were uh, any any you know, any uh, disorder in the city or any tension uh, if there was a strike it could could turn into very easily turn into a yeah, an anti-jewish pogrom there were a number of them there is a, a problem in this because they they were never they were never recorded anti-jewish pogroms in in the printed uh, documents but you you find the, you find things where uh, a mob a mob uh, attacking attacking the pharmacy but when the pharmacist comes out with an icon and uh, shows that he's a russian orthodox then the crowd becomes quiet and respectful and and they they move on now uh, there's a a uh, the the first the first uh, strike or demonstration that that i have found record was i think in 1872 uh, when there were very few people in use of kiev but it it included an attack on the jews there and they, they went um, in 1905 you had you had the same thing and uh, in the civil war that uh, almost goes without saying because the Civil War, both, both from the white side and the red side, it, it, uh, there were numerous pogroms, but uh, there, there, there were four or five cases that I've got mentioned in in here. Well, that's those are the people who were who were there. Uh, it was it was the Russians who had the contact with the Jews and who who uh, had the friction with them. The Ukrainians were outside of it all because they were they were uh, not in the city. Although they, you know there there are uh, some some uh, occasions of where when when uh, there was pillaging, uh, peasants would hear of it and come into the settlement to see if they could grab something. So, but that was rather that was minor. It wasn't. It wasn't the beginnings. It wasn't the instigation of the pogrom. It was only as a, uh, a sort of a side effect. It wasn't so much a matter of uh, of killings, um, but uh, people getting beaten up, and mostly it was property damage. Uh, I don't. I don't recall that I have any any figures on uh, on the deaths that might have been now um, because the first one was was stopped by Hughes and his uh, and his British workers who were there and they 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 put a stop to the to the riot immediately they didn't want any disorders the 1892 one went until until the the army after a couple of days moved in which you know you let them let off steam and and beat up a few jews and then you then you make order because you don't want property damage and certainly don't want the the factory damaged because that's the heart of the of the existence of the settlement and that that, that was a fairly common uh, pattern of, of behavior Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.